All right, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, we have we have the pleasure of having Dr. Prashant Nadal with us. Um, before we begin, I want to briefly introduce him and give you a brief bio. I know most of you here already know him, but just um, he is uh, Dr. Prashant Nadal is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the NIST Regulatory Research Center at West Virginia University. He is also a distinguished recipient of the Nani Parkiwala Gold Medal and Shark Tank Think Tank 2020 Award from um, Atlas Network. Notably, again as you all know, he was heading the research team here at Center for Civil Society from 2020 to 2023. And during his tenure here, he made significant contributions to prominent journals and played a pivotal role in policy advocacy, notably on the Street Vendors Act, so testifying what kind of amendments should be introduced to the Act. Um, and he offered recommendations for easing doing business. Prashant's academic pursuits include uh, teaching constitutional and corporate law as an assistant professor at the University of Delhi. His research includes a comprehensive study of the responsiveness of education providers in Jharkhand. Apart from that, he's also done a background paper uh, for UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report in 2022. Uh, so with a huge round of applause, let's uh, welcome Dr. Prashant Nadal. Uh, Today he will be speaking on two areas uh, which he is very passionate about and has uh, expertise on. Uh, one is rule of law and that he will connect to livelihood freedom. So he will talk about the implications of rule of law on livelihood freedom in India. Specifically he is planning to focus on live music performers and how restrictions on restaurants and eateries can indirectly uh, affect their livelihood. Uh, so with that brief introduction I hand it over to you Prashant. Um, sorry, just one last thing. So the format would include Prashant presenting for about 30 minutes and then we'll have a discussion. So we'll go to the floor. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the introduction part, which you already, of course, know and you know me. I think this is just for the recording purpose. So uh, rule of law, how many of you have already seen this presentation on rule of law? You have seen short show. Okay. Because two of you are from Macadamy, so I don't mind if they've already seen, others are not seen. So I'll first start with the concept of uh, the rule of law. And um, academic people would probably know that, you know, we always start the presentation on rule of law with an animation. And there are two stories that we usually start with. One is Yurt the Turtle, uh, and the other story is, uh, you know, taken from a Hindi, from taken from Hindi literature or a Hindi play by Bhartiyangu Harish Chandra. This play was written in 1886, probably. Andhir Nagri Chopper Raja, and it's a popular proverb now in Hindi. Andhir Nagri Chopper Raja, Tate Se Bhati, Tate Se Khata. So, when we show Yurtal the Turtle animation, it is about how one turtle tries to become the king, tries to dominate other turtles, and he commands everyone to make a kind of a tower, and the tower falls apart, and uh, you know. So that takes us to the concept of generality, that how power should not be vested in one individual. But does it mean that monarchies are bad and democracy is good? That's one question that it leads to. And second, when we talk about Andhri Nagri, Chopat Raja, Take Se Bhaji, Take Se Khata, I don't know how many of you are aware or familiar with the story. Okay. So uh, the story is about uh, a guru or a sage and with his two disciples, they wander from one place to the other, they reach a city and the city is quite cheap, you know, whatever you want to buy, whether you buy almonds or you buy cleaners, they have the same price, so there is price control. And one of the disciples is very happy because he is able to enjoy sweets and almonds and cashews for dirt cheap prices. And the guru says that this place is dangerous. We shouldn't stay here. We should leave this place immediately as soon as possible. And he surprised. He said, why should we do that? We should stay here. This place we should enjoy. And uh, he refuses to go. So he refuses to abandon, to leave this group and tries to settle there. Now it turns out, of course, the guru and the other uh, companion, they both, two of them leave. And this guy settles here in the city and he enjoys so much so that he gains weight after a few months and there is an accident so you know summons 
goat dies because of some negligence and the king holds a trial and eventually the trial you know when they try to find out who was guilty they keep shifting the blame to the other person they say oh you know the goat died because the ball fell and the ball fell he says well i didn't use uh, cheap quality mixture the i put too much of water so the person who supplied the water is to be blamed and the person who supplied the water says well there was a possession going on in the city and so i got distracted so that person so they keep shifting the blame finally they got hold of someone but when they you know tighten the noose it turns out that his neck is too small to lean and they say okay we should find a person whose neck fits the noose and this guy who's being played finally is found to fit the noose so two things are characteristic you know features of this city one is price control and second thing is arbitrariness in judicial process and at that juncture finally he realizes that he's made a mistake and his guru was right he shouldn't have settled in the city so now he thinks of the guru and lo and behold the guru is there he says okay why do you need me he says i look i am in a problem you were right i made a mistake of settling here now you tell me what i should do so he says okay now do exactly what i say they both start fighting and he says i should die and he says no i should die first and the king is quite uh, puzzled and he says why do you want to die first and you know why why are you fighting among yourself to to die i mean who wants to die and you know this is quite surprising they say no this is very auspicious murta and coincidentally it is very auspicious murta <laughs> so he says whoever dies in this murat will directly go to heaven and then the king says well i should die there <laughs> and then he chooses to uh, take the noose and die so the moral of the story of course is twofold one is price control as i said and the other one is <coughs> the arbitrariness in judicial trial and arbitrariness in judicial trial is quite common you know we all know that it is one of the features of uh, the rule of law uh, but what about price control because price control often is studied in economics and we don't always associate price controls with the rule of law so okay let's then talk about what is the rule of law you know we you are all here at ccs and you have talked about uh like we would be then we talk about liberty we talk about markets and so of course we are familiar with the basic tenets of economics and each one of you is very well familiar with all these concepts right the rule of law is one concept where of course most people you know general lay people are not familiar with the rule of law and sometimes um, of course lawyers may may not be familiar <coughs> but economists i am not expecting that many of them would be familiar with the rule of law concept so it is very important to understand what is the rule of law and classical liberal liberalism as it stands you know the four pillars of classical liberalism what is the rule of law it is very diffi- difficult or one can't envisage a liberal society without uh, this pillar which we know as the rule of law so there are several things about rule of law one example is of course demonetization demonetization was it rule of law or rule of a man so what is how do we differentiate between rule of law and rule of a man or rule of men it could be a man it could be a, it could be men it could be a woman or it could be women so it's not about gender specific and of course these pronouns are or you know terms are used in gender neutral manner and also plural or singular that also doesn't matter you know we monarchy or democracy rule of law is different from democracy can anyone explain why rule of law and democracy are two different things why it is not always necessary that a democratic society will be based on the rule of law sure okay yeah, that's okay uh, democracy 
by the very virtue definition of it essentially means that everybody has an opinion or in this case everybody votes and uh, whatever the largest majority decides of the people who have voted that happens. Mm -hmm. Now whatever the largest majority largest group decide need not always be coherent with the principles of rule of law. For example, if the largest group decide to kill the rest, yeah. it's democracy but not rule of law. Absolutely. So excellent. So uh, democracy is about majority rule and majority may not always be right. It may sometimes also be oppressive and hence, you know, it's not necessarily a rule of law society. Rule of law is not really a legal doctrine, it's a meta-legal doctrine, it's a, it's a political ideal. You know, it's about what the society should be or what the system should look like, right? So it's not about what the law is, it's about what the law ought to be, right? And when we say what is law, law is coercion or punishment for breaking an announced general rule. And each of this word is very, very important, you know, announced and general. And so this is why these are some of the features of the rule of law, that, you know, law has to be stable and predictable. We often say that Hayek talked about, you know, how planning is bad. He never said planning is bad. Planning is very good. And, but the question is who plans and for whom. So individuals should plan and for the individual, right? He was against central planning. And these two things, the rule of law and central planning can't go hand in hand. Why? Because if someone else is planning for you, then you, it would be very difficult for you to plan uh, your own affairs, your financial affairs, your personal affairs. So it's very important that the regime, the legal regime, the law, the rules of the game under which, within which that you play are stable and predictable. And how will rules be stable and predictable is that law has to be prospective. We have all heard of Vodafone case, right? It was about retrospective taxation. So suddenly the government makes up and says that oh, we need more revenue and let's you know, uh, create a retrospective law. So in India, retrospective criminal statutes are not allowed. Those are constitutionally prohibited. Article 20 expressly prohibits retrospective constitutional uh, criminal statutes. But retrospective taxation statutes are not expressly prohibited. You can have a tax law which is not to say that it happens often, it doesn't happen, but it's not expressly prohibited in the constitution of India. Right? But in generally speaking, that you shouldn't have retrospective laws. Right? So today you decide for example, after Nirvya rape case, there was one juvenile accused and there was a huge public demand that the juvenile should also uh, get death punishment, death penalty. Okay. So even if the law gets amended after the offence is committed, you can't apply that amended statute to the act committed, to that particular act committed. You can apply it prospectively but not retrospectively. Similarly, law has to be known and certain. Suppose there is a law, and I remember, you know, once we were working on uh, uh, repeal laws project, and we approached uh, one of the state governments, specifically Delhi government. We met one of the higher, higher ranking officials, and uh, we asked and requested them to share a list of all the laws, right, so that we can then identify which laws should be repealed. And the officer told us that they don't have a list of all the laws. So the concerned department, the government itself doesn't have a full database of the laws that exist that apply to the citizens. Right? So what will they enforce and what are we supposed to comply with if we don't know the laws? So and if you don't know the law or we don't certainly know that you know which laws are out there, how will there be predictability of the law? So stable and predictable regime, these are two different things. I gave you the example of demonetization. The biggest critique of demonetization is that it was sudden and unpredictable. So laws by definition shouldn't be sudden and unpredictable. They have to be predictable. 
Now, generality. Generality is equal treatment of laws. I'll come to it in a bit in detail. So, you have now the definition of what the law is supposed to be. How is it different from rule of men? Which is also that not only the same laws apply to the lawmakers, but their power is limited. Their discretion should be limited. They shouldn't have infinite power. Right? So there should be some constraint imposed on the government. So mainly four things. One is that laws should apply equally to everyone, including the people who make those laws. There should be some constraint imposed on the people, or on the government, and it should be stable and predictable regime. Now, all of that is fine, but unless there is a system to keep a check, to supervise this, the system won't be successful, and hence there has to be an independent judicial and judicial review. And that's the fourth part of the fourth feature of rule of law. Right. Now, you see, the lady justice is always blindfolded. Right. And in Hindi also we say Andha Kanun. So why is the Kanun, why is the law blind? Why is it blindfolded? If it is blindfolded, how will it appreciate the evidence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it basically means that there should be equality before the law, right? Your caste, your gender, your <coughs> race, skin color, whether you are rich or poor, that shouldn't matter. Law has to be equal for everyone. Right? Now, take this example. Is this a general law or is it a specific law? Does it apply equally to all? No. It does. It does. Because it says no personal establishment capital. It does create a criteria on whom you can employ. So in that way, one could argue that it's unfair to those under 25. But uh, it's applicable to all people and establishments. But man under age of 25 or any woman, regardless of age. Yeah. Or any women. Okay, it's regardless of age. Okay. I mean, the way it's worded, it seems like there is an age. Yeah. So it says any man under the age of 25 years or any yeah. woman. Uh, there is no age criteria yeah. for women, so there is differential. Yeah, so I think what Chandra is saying is general for the employers. Right? General for the employers, but the way law applies is through, I mean, it applies to employers, but it has a impact on the employees. Yeah. Is this a Union law or state law? State law. State law. Mm -hmm. So, this law is not general, it's a specific law, right? Because it differentiates, it discriminates between men and women. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, for example, for live music performances. So, live music performances in, this, in Bangalore, especially for Bangalore, you know, Karnataka government had come up with, a, uh, with an order. Uh, with a licensing order wherein they license live music performances in restaurants and bars. So the issue was that can you have live music where liquor is being served and where food is being served? So first of all, it's an odd question that what is the problem? <laughs> what is the rationale of licensing live music where, where food is being served or for that matter even music is being served? Well, uh, sorry, liquor is being served. And one of, in one of the judgments, and there are so many judgments, initially I came across two judgments, but as I, you know, that deeper, it seems that it's a very long thread of uh, jurisprudence, there are so many cases. And one of the Supreme Court judges asked that question, that what will happen if people will listen to music while having liquor? <laughs> So the rationale is not very clear. But recording music is fine? That's also a question <laughs> that they ask when they interpret. Because the excise rules, you know, under one of the excise rules, I think it's rule 11, which says that you can't have entertainment with uh, where you sell or serve record. 
And so the question is that, you know, and they look at the definition of entertainment in dictionaries and other laws, to find out that entertainment may include food, it may include music, it may include and many other things, right? And so if we apply this definition, then there is an excise license CL9, which is issued to eateries or restaurants. So there is a contradiction there, right? So how can you have this sort of definition where entertainment includes serving of food also? Because food is being served at many places where liquor is sold or stuff. So, yeah. I'll come back to live music performance in a bit. <laughs> this is another example. What do you think? Is this a general law or a specific law? Performance of dance of any kind or type in any eating house permit room or beer bar is prohibited. Yeah, so B says that it won't apply to uh, dance performance in a drama theatre, cinema theatre, auditorium, sports club, gym khana, where entry is restricted to its members only, or a three star or above hotel, or in any other establishment or class of establishments which with regard to the tourism policy of the state or central government for promoting the tourism or cultural activities, which the state government may by special or general order specify in this behalf. So A, of course, all of this is exempted and then anything else, any other place can also be exempted by the state government if they specify, if they issue an order. So it is a specific order because it differentiates between class of premises right so what is so wrong with this if it is specific what will go wrong and one thing that comes to my mind is the first question you want to ask is if there's any reasonable way in which there is solution between the categories yeah. uh, otherwise it seems like it's arbitrary like you're mm. Some are exempted from the rule and some are. So some are wearing the burden and some are. True. So some are exempted. So what is wrong with that exception? Yes, I she created two different classifications of, uh, uh, say, good service providers. And essentially saying, okay, one group of people can go drink and enjoy dance performance, other group of people, if you can't go to a place that you don't get to drink and enjoy a dance performance as such. Or I can't even start a, like a place unless I have enough capital to make it a three star or higher. Okay. So that's an unreasonable classification as such that is happening. That's right. So what is happening here is they are exempting uh, high class eateries or um, you know performance places like the gym khana club, sports club, auditorium, cinema theatre. Whereas the beer bars are essentially being targeted. So there is a classification based on class. Right? So places where rich go and have liquor, those places are exempted. But where probably middle class people go and have liquor, those places are being covered. And that would lead to, I mean it would indirectly impact the bar dancers. Right? So this was challenged by uh, bar owners as well as bar dancers. So we understand now the distinction between uh, general law and specific law. Now we know that GST has different classes. Now would you say that is this general or specific? Because different categories of taxation under GST apply to different groups. Right. So for example, 28%, it applies to all the goods that are in 28% category. And uh, if something is exempt, then of course there are other things in that category. 
But the question is that what is the rationale of that classification? How do you know that some something should fall in 28%, something else should fall in, should be exempt? So there are two things. One is that there is classification, so it's not general. But if there is a if there is some rationale for that classification, then maybe it makes sense. But you think that there is a rational thing for classification? Uh, isn't it about the course you can be a uh, if you are buying a TV, obviously you are rich, so you can buy it. Uh, therefore, there will be twenty eight percent GST on that. And if you are just uh, buying some necessary items or for grocery items, there will be uh, on Atta you have five percent, I guess. GST, so that is necessary. Uh, TV is not necessary for living. So I guess the, the whole concept was that ke kahan pe kisna cost we are Okay. Do you agree with that? So what is the GST on diamonds? Zero percent or five percent, I think. Uh, so what is the GST on diamonds? Very low. One point some percent. It's less than one percent. It's a category of its own which is not reflected here. It's zero point two five percent. And what is the logic behind it or national? You should ask the DSC council for logic. It's a rational. It's just not economic rational. It's a political rational for where the DSC slabs are made. Okay. So that. If the Panerji has a very high... So same for Panerji, I mean he said 5% right for Atta because that's a good which is of necessity. Is Panerji 4 rupees packet, I mean a, a necessity good, a basic good? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Or yeah. even for the pattern middle class rich people, I think it's a basic yeah. that yeah. across classes everybody would love to dip in their tea. Yeah. 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 In Paris is a luxury. Yeah. yeah, I mean most Indians would think that it's very common good, right? Basic. Yeah. Yeah. The category is uh, biscuits, right? Not Paris in particular. The category would be biscuits. Well, you know, okay. for example, good day, ten rupees, butter bite. I would differentiate it from Parleji. Parleji is really a very basic. But under the law, uh, the term used is what? Biscuits or sandwiches? Cookies. 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 There are two different categories? Yeah. So, so I, my question, question is, where should Parleji 4 rupees packet fall? Which category should it fall into? 5% according to you. 5% right? Most of us would think 5%. Let's say maybe 12%. But which category does it fall into? Can you check? 18%. So diamonds into 0.25% and parity. So maybe because diamond like not a lot of work is required to process the diamond in the sense that it's the main source and parity or biscuits have different people involved in the entire process. So maybe just to kind of compensate for that it's 18% and this has 3%. Just a wide guess. No, but everything about the diamonds. So, I mean, you can come up with many such rationale, but the question is that on what basis is the taxation decided, and how do you then justify the categorization of it? Political characters. So that's right, which is not always based on rational classification. Right. Now, hypothetically speaking. Let's say I'll give you another example. This is a hypothetical example. May not be true. But let's say the central government made tea tax free and imposed 18% GST on coffee. Okay? And let's assume that the party in power, central government, has strong hold in Hindi speaking states, which are also tea consuming states. Do you think there is some rational classification here? So it's political calculus, right? Okay, we can skip this for now. And yeah, so you know, Gandhi is his take on end and means goes very well with the rule of law because he said that if one takes care of the means, the end will take care of itself. And this is exactly what Hayek says about rules of the game. 
So suppose there is a match, right? Any sports, um, you can't predict the outcome. All you can take care of is the rules of the game. The outcome, of course, it would depend. You know who plays, how. So if a if a if a team plays well, then they probably will win. But the rules shouldn't be leaned towards any particular sports team. You won't say that okay, this team, uh, you know, they work hard. However, they are disadvantaged, so you know, let's give them extra overs, right? Or allow them to do batting first. So the rules are very neutral always, right? So you can't predict the outcome. You can only take care of the rules of the game, and this is what Gandhi says that you can always take care of the means and not the end. So, in India, and Article 14 in our Constitution talks about equal protection of laws, and that says that um, there has to be an intelligible differential. What exactly I said about rational classification? So you can have classification, but it has to be rational classification. Now, one thing that I want to say here is most Indian judgments, and Shorto is from law background. Anybody else from law background here? No. So most Indian judgments, you know, when they challenge any sort of classification, right? And classification is always that you know the law is uh, treating something else uh, maybe more softly and giving harsher treatment to me or you know some sort of harsh impact on me. This is the constitutional challenge looks like, you know, either challenging some sort of discrimination or unequal treatment, and the judge. The court always asks the petitioner, the person who is challenging, to give some evidence, which means that there is presumption that the classification is correct. Right? The parliament is coming up with some classification, treating two different two individuals differently or two things differently, and the onus of proving that this classification is incorrect is on the petitioner. And that is a problem, right? Instead, the onus should be on the parliament or on the exactly. lawmaker to kind of justify that why unequal treatment is justified. So that's one thing. Similarly, Hayek talks about presumption of liberty, right? So something which is not restricted is allowed to do. Right? So for example, flying drones. When there was no policy, when there was no law that restricted flying drones, then you should be able to fly drones. Right? The first thing the government said that oh, we don't have a law that restricts flying drones, so let's ban the drones first and then we'll make the law. We need some time to think about how to go about regulating drones. So meanwhile, let's ban drones. But banning requires the law. And when I say a law, in our constitution scheme, the law has to be a legislation passed by the parliament. It can't be an order issued by the government, right? So this is something very basic in our system that there is an organ which is legislature. It could be state legislature, it could be parliament. That has to make a law. And that law has to be, uh, I mean, to, to be able to ban any activity, it has to be a legislation, it can't be an order. So the orders that government pass and executive authority passes, be it the municipal corporation or some other department, it is usually passed under some law, right? So for example, ban on onions, onion exports. It is passed under maybe the foreign trade act. Foreign trade and the act. Right, foreign trade act. Or some sort of let's say ban on storage of onions is passed under the Essential Commodities Act. So there is some law under which the government department passes an order. But the government can't pass an order, any for example municipal authority or any other authority can't pass arbitrary orders without a law. There has to be some law which would sanction a passing of an order. Right? There has to be legislation. Similarly, if Flying of drones is not prohibited by a law. The government could not have banned flying of drones without a law. Or for that matter, e-rickshaws. Right? 
So I looked at the Eriksha judgment. The judge says uh, that there is presumption of liberty, so we can't, uh, you know, stop people from applying Erikshas. But they interpret the definition of Eriksha to be covered under Motor Vehicles Act, and so they say there yeah, that we can't stop Erikshas because it is covered under Motor Vehicles Act. So, when we talk about classification, how it is being judicially reviewed is that there has to be reasonable classification based on intelligible differentiation and there has to be rational nexus. Rational nexus is what you want to achieve and how you are classifying, there has to be nexus. For example, the reasoning that you gave. So, what is the objective of classification and whether there is a nexus between that classification and the objective being put there, right? Now, Europe has a different kind of standard of review, which is proportionality standard of review. And the first question they ask is whether it's a legitimate aim, whether that means, you know, we talk about end and means, those means are suitable to achieve the aim, suitable to achieve the end, right? So, for example, let's say population control. First is, is that a legitimate, legitimate aim? Do we need to control the population? Yeah. Second thing is, what is the most suitable means to control population? Assuming that <laughs> the judge finds it a negative, that we should control the population. Now the question is, what is the most suitable means to control population? So what are the different ways to control population? <laughs> Even better would be genocide. <laughs> <laughs> <And> most efficient. <laughs> Most efficiently, right? But is it suitable? <laughs> yeah. Of course yeah. not. What about post sterilization? Is it suitable? Aim? Right? So, then necessity. Necessity is that if there is a lesser restrictive alternative, can you achieve the same end through a lesser restrictive alternative? And so, then why do you want to go for a harsher measure? And then balancing, what are the competing interests? Right? And how do you balance those competing interests? So, for example, environment and livelihood. Okay, so the question is then should specific laws be allowed? And so when we decide that question, I think the question to be asked is that is it a group law? If it's a group law, then does a group want a specific law for itself? Or is it that others want to impose that specific law on the group? Can you think of an example? Section 377. Hmm. Who did it apply to? LGBT? Did they choose 377 for themselves? Or others were applying it to them? Right. Was it a liberty enhancing law or liberty curtailing law? For whom? LGBT or for others? LGBT. It curtailed their liberty, right? Is there any subsection of minority that is opposed to the demand for a specific law? So, for example, triple talaq, right? Triple talaq is a, uh, a law which applies to minority. But within the minority, is there any subset of the minority that was either in favor or against the law? Yes. Does majority also want the special treatment? So, for example, reservation. So, that's a specific law. But is it a law that majority also wants? Yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 when a group press impose a non veg tag, right? <coughs> That is a uh, imposition that they want on somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. So that also falls under the first question that I put here. Yeah. Say yeah. if a, on a certain law, so they want to a liberty enhancing law. Yeah, liberty protecting for others. But you need to ask these questions together, right? Because it's possible that a group wants a specific law for itself, but that's not alone important to judge whether a specific law should be. So you should ask all four questions, but all four questions may not apply in all cases. Yeah. So this can be and or. So there may be some laws that are about speci special privileges, right? Some laws may be about special privileges. Some laws may be about special sanctions, 
about some punitive measures or some unequal treatment. So it depends. I mean, unequal treatment they will be because it's a specific law, but it would be some reward or incentive or disincentive, some penalty. So it depends on what is the context. Like the bar dancer, for example, that you provided earlier. Yeah. I mean, the exception was well, liberty announcing. Yeah. It wasn't liberty criteria, so I think it's a specific law. In some sense, the prohibition is the problem. No, but look, but you more said, and more people you get said the exemptions are liberty enhancing. Yeah. It's okay. But the question is, is the law liberty enhancing? As a whole. So the law is liberty curtailing. Sure. Because it is curtailing liberty of some people. Hmm. It's not enhancing liberty for others, no. it is preserving liberty of sure. others by curtailing liberty of others. Ah, preserving liberty. Yeah. Okay, so this is about rule of law. Now, if we were to apply this to, uh, you know, livelihoods issue or licensing issues. So, I'll give you an example of, we have examples of uh, bar dancers, bar servers. And then another example, you look at the shabulers in Delhi, the MCD regulation, it says that they cannot, they have to own the rickshaw that they operate and they cannot own more than one. Yes. That is essentially a liberty curtailing law and is not allowing, and that does in fact this subsection of people. Because if I have a, if I'm an auto rider or a car rider, I can have more than one, and I need not own the auto or the car that I'm operating, but only in this way I would have to. Yeah. So for autos also, I think the rule is one person, one driver, one auto rickshaw. Uh, but you are right for private cars, there is no rule. Now, one can argue that those are private cars. So, it's a different category. So, this law is good for a different category, which is public transport. But the question is that what is the objective? If the objective is to minimize the number of vehicles on roads, then it makes more sense to curtail private vehicles than public transport vehicles. Not mm -hmm. to mean that. They should. But it's also not like people like Ola cars. Is applicable to the auto rickshaws or also for the Ola cars and taxis? No, you're right, it is only yeah. for auto rickshaws yeah. and for, uh, for, for cycle rickshaws. Yeah. Taxis are like these taxi stands, they will own like multiple cars. Right. Right. For the yellow and black taxis, I'm not sure. Okay. The, so, so cycle rickshaws, it was very clear because they came out with bylaws yeah. and the bylaws were mentioned in the judgments. Mm -hmm. I haven't come across any judgment on the Kalipiti taxis, so I'm not sure what is the situation there. But for auto rickshaws, there was a similar situation because, you know, by issuing licenses, they made it into the terms of uh, terms and condition of the licenses that person should own more than one rickshaw. Uh, but for taxis, I think the recent policy, because Ola Uber are very recent phenomena, uh, so maybe uh, there, you know, you could have a fleet of uh, uh, taxes. So the government just hasn't come across to banning them yet. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's a good example that should you have uh, one person, one rickshaw, or one person, one auto rickshaw rule, well, private cars do not have such rule. Similarly, is the thing, the cap on the number of uh, scooters, taxis, uh, and the cap, there is no cap on the number of private vehicles. For example, Singapore has. Right? So they have a limited number of permits. If you want to have a car, then you also have to buy a permit. But well, in that case, isn't it enter into a trade for permits? Because can I sell my permits in a much higher price? So that's right. That there at least the permit is tradable. Okay. Uh, in case of cycle rickshaw pullers, that was not the case. So that made things even worse. But the cost of a permit is more than a small car anyway. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the taxi credit permits were traded in that market, right? Because they were not officially traded. So auto insurance, I know that it was being traded uh, in, in, in that market. <laughs> okay. okay, any questions? So, so in the beginning, when you're talking about so, law should not be with retrospective effect, right? But tax laws are. So, tax, tax laws can be with retrospective yeah. So, are those tax laws inherently unacceptable of rule of law? 
inherently against the principles of rule of law. So tax norms are not always retrospective. They are retrospective. They may be retrospective. Yeah. So in those cases, they are against the principles of rule of law. Retrospective laws are against the principle of rule of law. But uh, is there some reason why? So is there a uh, legal or economic reason why the Supreme Court or the any court does not those norms? So I give you an example of uh, Section 7 of Hindu Marriage Act. Uh, Section 7 of Hindu Marriage Act was uh, it's a Tamil Nadu amendment that allowed marriages that happened in Tamil Nadu after the self-respectors movement. Right. So the marriage is solemnized in the absence of a pandit without observing the very rigid uh, traditional Hindu customs. So for example, during Saptapadi, right. So some marriages during that movement were solemnized without observing subsequently and without inviting any money. Hmm. Then after some time the question arose that are those marriages valid Hindu marriages? Because the children born out of those wedlock, are they legitimate children? If they are not, then the succession, you know, pa passing of property. So whether they will be in able to inherit their parents' uh, property or not. So what the legislature did in Tamil Nadu, they said that two people, uh, a man and a woman, announcing, declaring that they are husband and wife, just by exchanging gardens or you know tying of Mangal Sutra are valid uh, husband and wife. So any couple that enters into the territory of Tamil Nadu, declaring their husband and wife, just by exchanging gardens, becomes husband and wife. So it is considered to be a married into marriage. So this was done retrospectively. This was liberty enhancing for people who had already decided. Yeah. Tax generally is the yeah. government coming back later and saying you owe me money. Yeah. So that is a liberty enhancing for everybody except the government. And it's retrospectively reduced the tax. Yeah, that is okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think of any example of a government comes back and he's like, yeah, it's like yeah, they say you owe that's right. So I, I think, you know, the way higher court look at it, if you have presumption of liberty, uh, then any couple, you know, if they are asked to testify whether they are husband or wife, I think the court in high king world will not ask anyone else to give a proof. If the husband and wife, if the man and woman says that they are husband and wife, they consider to be husband and wife. Unless there is evidence to the contrary. Yeah. If somebody has comes and claims that they are not husband and wife. Oh, they are already married to me. <laughs> yeah, that is the most likely one. You first and then you have So I was just asking, uh, a couple uh, married in the Tamil Nadu, they uh, were married in other states also? Or <laughs> 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 this is a silly question. They were married in the marriage across India. <laughs> yeah. But that particular way of getting married is for Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Once they are declared to be married, uh, then of course they are married for less of a year. And of course, in the process, we will be married. But you are not married. You can then say that you can go to Tamil Nadu as soon as the train enters into the territory of Tamil Nadu, you can get married before the pandemic. Because I was confused, I have heard the rule. There is a country, I don't remember the name. Uh, there only uh, one spouse can file the divorce and get divorced. Is it true? So I don't know which one. Yeah, so they can do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My doubt is just in general. If well, how is the if the uh, if there's a change in the law, but the decision on a case is pending, then is the new law applied to the decision, or it is based on when the act of the, the criminal act was uh, uh, took place? Is it applied for at that date? Criminal statutes are always applied retrospectively. So the amendment will also apply retrospect. Uh, sorry, prospectively. Criminal statutes are always applied prospectively. 
and the amendment if it is amended, that amendment would also be applicable prospectively. It so, if the act was committed before the amendment was made, then, then the amendment will have no effect the on the okay. uh, on that particular act. And that's not the case with the other, like if it's not a criminal case, then what's the Usually, the amendments have a clause uh, that all acts done before that amendment, whether that amendment will have any bearing or not. So, for example, let's say school education act. Uh, you know, I think yeah. some of the school education acts had that provision that the new amendment, under the new amendment, the old cases, uh, actions, transactions, etc., will continue to. Yeah. There is some saving clause, and so it depends on the wording of the clause that what kind of effect will the new law have on the old one. Sometimes it replaces the law, uh, the old one, and so it will deem to continue, will have to have same effect on the previous transactions to validate those transactions. It also depends on the answer to that question. Yes. Quite a few. Yeah, this fact that also depends on the nature, right? Because in case there were a lot of pending litigations and the law was brought in to ensure that the, those kind of litigations don't come in, the law could automatically say that, hey, okay, we are changing the law and any litigation which is pending yeah. because of this law, they will be considered to be uh, yeah. terminated right now because now that the matter has already been closed. Because the matter becomes moved then. Yeah, yeah. Such, the matter wasn't moved when the case was filed, but since we have gotten a lot of resolve so the matter will not be done further. Then. Okay, the beginning of the talk, you contrasted or differentiated between the rule of law and democracy. Or fear and bad care means or ends. So I wonder if the rule of law and all the principles that we talked about, do they say something about how the ends are chosen? For example, uh, I talked about population control. You know, those are the GST, multiple tax rates and slabs and the concepts. Slash do ne chahiye, paanch ho ne chahiye. Whatever ends are chosen, does rule of law principle say something about the ends chosen? So rule of law is very clear. It is only about rules, which is rules of the game, meaning that it is only concerned about the means. How the ends are chosen? Uh, so it says that you shouldn't. I mean, a central planner or a central authority must not choose ends. The individual has to choose ends for himself or herself. Because the minute any central planner would choose ends, then the individual ends would be difficult to achieve for the individual. Then, by that principle, most of the ends which are chosen today and the laws are, you know, then enacted, would be against the principles of rule. Absolutely, because you see, the Indian Constitution, Chapter Four of the Indian Constitution is about directive principles of state and policy. Our Constitution has chosen some ends, and those ends make it very difficult for us to hire people at a rate that we want to hire, to you know do things with our money the way we want to do things, right? So those ends are in conflict, they clash with individual ends quite often. So we talked about generality and uh, so specific laws and general laws. There was um, also about so I mean the, those were the questions we raised uh, we can also talk about solutions you know then how should we go about specific laws so one is that exempt that domain from regulations for all if everybody wants that kind of law then maybe exempt that domain or communitize or privatize the resource if it's about resource allocation or the criteria should be identity neutral. So, for example, the bar, uh, you know, the sale of liquor. What you can do is you can make age criteria. Age criteria is still a neutral criteria. Not to mean that age criteria doesn't curtail liberty. It may still curtail liberty because, for example, what age would you say? 18, 21, 25. In Delhi, it's 25, right? So, but A, it is still a general criteria. And then every person, you know, would be less than that age at some point and would cross that age at another point, right? So it is still an identity neutral criteria. What would be an identity based criteria? Is that when you have a law which is based on, let's say, 
your caste, religion, yeah. gender, those are identity based criteria. So for example, for reservation, I think there was a policy suggestion by uh, an academic, I think from IIM Antama, that you could probably give reservations to first generation uh, undergrads or first generation uh, graduates. <coughs> right? That would be an identity neutral criteria. Mm -hmm. Sorry, how? Okay. Everyone, like, how do you define age, that everyone passes that age? So it is not at least connected to an identity or related to caste, religion, gender. But it's a, it is an immutable characteristic. Yeah. 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 So why generality? I mean, then there are some consequentialist arguments, utilitarian arguments that uh, you know, you have specific laws to sometimes appease majorities, sometimes also appease minorities, right? So this is why you should not have, it relates to a lot of conflict of interest, nepotism, special interest group dynamics, and class conflict, etc. The other important thing was about discretion, and this is important uh, here is an example, I'm not getting into the example, but discretion basically means that government authority or a delegated authority having the power to decide something for people, right? Now, strictly speaking, administrative law would mean that the law has to be passed by the parliament or the state legislature and the way to implement only that limited aspect should be with the administrator. Now this example, if you see, the administrator has a bit too much discretion to implement the law because the administrator can decide what is an agriculture season and which villages will the restriction apply to, right? So both space and time, the administrator has the power to decide. So for example, you know, the work Jaira and I did on education, um, there are laws for example, in the parent statute which was passed by the parliament, it doesn't say anything about how schools should be registered. But the rules that the administrator passed, the rule says that the school has to be registered as a not-for-profit entity. So while parliament didn't legislate that, the administrator made all schools basically, you know, kind of banned for profit schooling. So something which parliament didn't decide. But the administrator decided and that still continues to the case. So 50 years on you know that we were um, we didn't have for profit schooling is because of some Babu <laughs> who was not empowered to pass that law. Entirely this is for our discussion. So in certain um, um, laws uh, we see a sentence along the lines of as the governing body may specify or as may be specified by the governing body. That's in that it. case, so how do we see it? So the fundamental, the basic principle tenet of administrative law is that the procedural details are with the administrator. For example, if there is a license, the form of application form to which you file for you apply for a license, that form will be designed by the administrator. How when you apply, how do you apply? how many days will it take to get back to you, etc. Some of these procedural details will be decided. But the administrative can't decide your substantive rights and duties. Somebody saying that the school has to be not for profit would mean that a for profit school is not allowed. So he's taken away your right to start a not for profit, a for profit school, right? Which means that you can't earn profit from school. It's a big blow to your rights. And this is not done through law, it is done through rules, delegated legislation. It is sometimes the case that um, the law may also say that the criteria can be decided by the executive. Yeah. Yeah. In which case, the executive is not exceeding its authority, but the law should be questioned because they are granting a lot of power to the executive. Right? So, this happened in case of live music performances. Mm -hmm. You know, they said that, uh, so first of all, I think for two years, they kept rejecting the license applications and the restaurants challenged that. 
and the restaurant says that none of us uh, <coughs> got the license. I mean, it's an unsaid, unwritten policy that they will not issue any licenses. Right? And they looked at the judge, looks at the rejection reasons. And sometime, I think, for a couple of years, they didn't even give reason or written orders, and they did not even deal with the. So, there are principles of natural justice that say that in terms of procedural justice, you should at least hear the parties if you're rejecting a license or rejecting an application, you should give a chance of hearing to the party. That's one thing. And second thing is, at least give reasons of a rejection. If you're rejecting an application, your reasons must be recorded. And if you're in writing, but at least give reasons. So the judge, initially, you know, the court passes those sort of orders. And when they give reasons, they give reasons such as, you know, this person didn't have enough parking. So parking is not a question if you are choosing to serve liquor. But parking becomes a question if you have to play music with liquor. <laughs> I mean, how will you have more cars and the government, uh, sorry, because the government uh, lawyer says, when because if they hear to music, they will take more time, they will spend more time in the legally, and so therefore more parking is required. <laughs> <laughs> In this specific case of schools not being for profit, and let's say there is nothing specified in the law, and it is only the rule. Yeah. Is there something that can be done? Like you should challenge. You should challenge it. Yeah. Um, but then they would say this is their own discretionary part to. Like, it's a policy matter, and therefore court. So. This is I mean. Uh, we clearly know that this is wrong and courts then come up with some justification but that justification i mean if you see law law is very black and white but the judgments are great yeah 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 right but even if you are following even delegated legislation the authority delegating cannot delegate powers beyond its own scope right so that can also be questioned that the Original laws have been drafted. Even if it delegates the power to do this, the laws have never had the scope to be delegating laws like this. So you are absolutely right. So the parents legislation has to have some guidance on, for example, Jaina said that you know it can have guidance. It can the parent law say that you can come up with criteria. But what criteria? Is there any guidance? So for example, if it says criteria and you have some criteria which is not even imagined under the parent law, you know, which is a really out of the world criteria that makes it very difficult for people to comply with the law. Then it can definitely be questioned because you can have they should have guidance and then you can't have sweeping discretion. It has to be within the four corners of the guidance. Okay. Sometimes the guidance is totally not there, yeah. then there will be sweeping discretion. <coughs> for example, in case of Delhi School Education Act, there is no guidance on what kind of school should be registered. Mm. Right? And they're coming up with substantive rights and duties. No, I was just asking the thing that I was wondering because uh, for rules that they have to sort of abide by the very frame of the original law, right? Because I think like for MBA, states have the discretion that you can have like this much time, this much time. So that they can decide, but not something as like not something major, like these kind of cards can't fly or something like that. That would be something in the original law. Yeah. I mean as long as it adheres to the basic document of the original yeah. law. So two fine last points I want to make. One is on the reasons that the authority gave by rejecting live music performances. One was parking. The other reason they said that you know they are employing women uh, in their premises, and as per the excise rules, Karnataka excise rules, they can't employ women. The judge says that they can't employ women for the purpose of excise rules, which means that the women can't serve or sell liquor. But tomorrow you will say because they can't employ women, that means the employer can't even have a women chartered accountant. Or a person who cleans the premise, or a person who does X, Y, Z, you know. Can also own a bar? So yeah. that's another question, you know, employee, what, what, what do it mean? So the judge says that it means we should keep it restricted and the judge says one interpretation is keep it restricted to the sale and uh, serving the liquor. Not to mean that the judge is upholding that 
indeed this is the thing. I mean, to know if there is a challenge to that, and which was of course the challenge there, you know, for building servers for bartenders. It was challenged and it was uh, stuck down for another state. Uh, but at least he says that a woman performer, live music performing performer should indeed be allowed. It doesn't restrict that. So if you are withholding the license because uh, there is a woman performer, that's not correct interpretation of the law. So that should be allowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think as it currently stands by interpretation, a woman can own the bar, run the bar, but cannot be this person serving alcohol in her own bar. In Kerala, I think. Mm -hmm. But not. In Karnataka, it's who says that they can't employ a guy. Definitely being for bar is mind boggling for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> then you also be defined the law. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the last. Yeah. I'm forgetting the point. So, there is another aspect of uh, the rule of law which I don't see discussed very often is the presumption of innocence, which does not exist in many laws. Policeman in Bihar can send an individual to jail uh, for drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the presumption of innocence uh, does not exist. Mm -hmm. the, the guy who is arrested is now in jail and now has to prove that I'm innocent. And, and there are several, several cases in corporate, uh, corporate laws and the gender bias laws mm -hmm. where there is simply the accused is simply. Probably very India specific because mm -hmm. I think this should be a rule of law. I think NDP has also as a presumption of guilt. So there are two the types of laws. Okay. So one is uh, extra, um, you know, uh, the laws that are anti terrorism laws. Yeah. Or they, uh, yeah. So those laws, of course, go to another extreme where there is no presumption of innocence. Uh, but also in some gender specific laws, there is no presumption of innocence and they reverse the rule of presumption. Uh, I think that presumption of innocence goes um, closely with presumption of liberty. Um, but you are absolutely right that in some cases it's reversed. It's not there. It was initially a very, uh, though I'm not an expert on uh, criminal stamp uh, but this was very rare. It used to be very rare earlier in criminal stamp groups to not have that presumption. For example, you know, accused goes to jail, right? That happens for uh, criminal statutes uh, that under the guilt is presumed, but you also have bail, right? And bail is the norm, but we know that uh, in many cases bail is not done easily, and uh, the norms are inconsistently applied. Can someone who is in prison can file uh, file litigation in public interest? It depends on the locus <coughs> on how he's connected to the issue. So, for an example, a school owner who is charged for corruption and for whatever, whatever reason is in prison, can file a case for for profit schools, making a case that the this thing is uh, definitely not standing right. against. Yeah, you can file, but not sure if the judge would like to admit. <laughs> <laughs> There's no clear bar on this. I cannot file a case just because I'm in prison, right? So, I said, well, why am I filing a case? And how does that? So, some high courts now have uh, rules or guidance on uh, who can file a public yeah. interest litigation on PIOs. But I thought PIO, the purpose is that the standing yeah. bar is considerably lower. Yeah, but this so unfortunately, a lot of law students find that find random PIOs. But a lot of law random law students find that find random PIOs and all. It just wasted a lot of court's time. So the, just to discourage that, I think some high courts came up with guidelines to say, okay, no, you can't just get up one day and come and find a PIA because you said, I read a newspaper which says this. Not yeah. just that, like analytics. Yeah, I think someone was find one back yeah. for the PIA yeah. yeah. against Rahul Gandhi's main statement. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> both so long. Yeah. Ah, yeah. One side week. Do we have that process? Yeah. 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 Why I thought so? Because someone who is sensible and running a school would actually not find it. go to court saying for uh, why schools, why a rule. I think an association of private that. schools can file that. Yeah. They should find Association of private schools can file Private in some states. 
challenging the for not for profit and bakery as well. Yeah, uh, to start a business, do you necessarily have to have a, a sort of permission from the government or can you do it on your own? Last slide is about the design details. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I ask is that if I necessarily need to have permission or a license to start a business, that would again you know, go to the chance point. Ki, the assumption is that no. innocence is not The presumption of innocence is wrong. Because you now necessarily have to take explicit permission before doing something which probably you should be doing. You know? I mean, no, but innocence and regulation. So innocence is usually criminal cases. But regulation is. Um, no, sure the liberty is lost. Yeah. That you don't have the freedom yeah. to do whatever without having a license. Just you know, try to do a business, engage in voluntary exchange transactions, but now you can't. So as an individual, you can, but if you want to do it through a company, so you are basically giving birth to a company, right? You are incorporating a company, and for that you need to. It's not taking permission necessarily. Yeah, it is a registry. You are registering a company. Taking permission is when you have to ask and on some basis the government will give you an approval. I think we're planning here and we'll work with us again, the outcome will be there. So I'm just saying in terms of Article 19, this uh, right to business and professional also comes to the exception. But with two of them, the same reason, the government, if it requires, it can put incorporate professional standards and all. They can say you cannot be a doctor unless you get a doctor's license, and you cannot go and practice in the court unless I get a bar license. Those are imported in the constitution itself. But that's also another part which says that uh, the government, if it decides, it can just say that nationalize any business in public. Yeah. Just nationalize any business in public. That, that part might not stand up to the definition of the law that you're seeing here. Because the government has to be doing itself. It just has to say in public interest, I'm going to nationalize this entire business. This is something we're doing with bitcoins as such. The government can run bitcoins, cryptocurrencies, nobody else can. You're right. So uh, in 1906, the government can nationalize any uh, business or part of it and it doesn't need to give it its immune from judicial review. And, uh, so that's drastic. But for any other restriction, it has to be reasonable restriction and in the interest of general public. And the full schedule line agriculture laws, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know. Just one thing, sorry. After short restriction, maybe you can wrap up and then we can continue the discussion. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Something to follow up on what this Kumar said. Are there any businesses in which to enter the market and need the government's permission first? As to trade some things, there might be. No, so there are licenses in many sectors. Yeah, yeah. so the licenses essentially. You so for example, recognition right. in education. In education, in education you need a license, you need recognition. It's and so there are many documents, etc. And it is tied to yeah. so many other uh, you know, compliances. So for example, land requirement and so on and so forth. Yeah, so in those businesses, unlike say I'm just starting a company for say social media marketing, I don't need a license from the government to do that. I just need to get it registered. Yes. So if Kumar is starting something in which he requires a license to do it, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Yeah, so he has, there isn't a presumption on his part that he can do it unless they say he can't. see, but the objective there is different. We use the word innocence. Uh, innocence is associated with uh, yeah. crime and yeah. criminal context and here uh, the idea the, the objective is that you have to have some minimal infrastructure or depending from you know sector to sector the objective may be some credibility or infrastructure or some other object so it's regulation okay thank you so much